Do whatever you want. It's your show. All right. Well, uh, super awesome. It's been a while. So welcome back, everyone. It's so great to see you. Uh, I have a an addiction expert with me today, a little bit of a of a twist, but I actually am really excited to speak with you today, Leonard. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you for uh, asking me to be here with you. Yay. Yay. And uh, so so I want to hear your conf confessions of my cannabis addict here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Confessions of a of a previous. A, a I don't know where to start. Maybe I should, I should be able to just. Can I just read something from from the book? Yes, please do. It's called Confessions, Hi. and it's here. Hi. Um, <laughs> Show me the book again. I'm gonna. <laughs> and is that you as a youngin? Yes, as a youngin. Yes. <laughs> as a. As, as a as, an inspired 22 year old. I had just come back. I had, uh, we ran out of speaking of cannabis. Hashish is, 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 I know people don't know about it anymore, but it was a very powerful THC induced, uh, infused drug, hashish, as people know from the movies and history and the hashish eaters. Uh, my friend and I, we couldn't find any in Philadelphia, and we would both been smoking hash regularly for about two years, and there seemed to be none available in Philadelphia. And we called everybody we knew in New York, and nobody had any hashish. So we decided to drop out of college and fly to Israel to bring back some. And because we just couldn't live without it, we couldn't imagine going a day without getting high. So were you that addicted to it that you couldn't uh, live without it or? Yes, yes I was, yes I was. I mean, I was willing to literally drop out of college. We thought it would just be for a semester. It ended up being for life until I went back to school to become a drug counselor a few years ago. Uh, yes, we were willing to risk our freedom by flying to the Holy Land to buy hashish and smuggle it back in through Kennedy Airport uh, because we needed it to live. And of course our family but thought we were going to- Did not find it anywhere local? Like why Israel? What was the- Because they, because it's next to Lebanon. The country above north of Israel is Lebanon. And we assume there'd be some camels or donkeys smuggling hashish into Israel. Okay. The only other choices were Afghanistan, Pakistan, or Morocco. And it seemed more, <laughs> it made more sense to go to Israel, which we did. And uh, luckily, we were able to, to each get like a pound and a half back into the United States uh, without having to go to jail for 10 years if we had been caught in New York City. But that's the, the extent that we were willing to go and the risks that we were willing to take because it seems as though there was no other choice uh, other than to go get some. And so like I said- Can I ask a question? So it like now that marijuana is legal just about everywhere, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, what is the difference of hashish and is that legal now too? But isn't it kind of just a that's different a great strand question. of I cannabis should have, or not? That's a great question. I hopefully they don't differentiate between marijuana and hashish, the way the legal system differentiated between powdered cocaine and crack cocaine, and one was, you know, more acceptable, and the other one you went to jail for. I don't know. I should call someone after this 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 thing and and find out that's if the great, answer is for us all right that's a great question well just oh curious <laughs> you know and, and yeah and i don't you know just by the way i don't I, I don't necessarily have a position either way and that's why i was curious to talk to you because um i actually i have a friend and he is a podcaster he has a show called cannabis and combat and 
Um, I do think that there's a lot of benefits to the the, the oils mm -hmm. for some people. Um, yeah. Well, there's a lot of benefit to marijuana also. You know, I mean, I think one of the great improvements in American society in the last 50 years is the legalization of marijuana. That was like a breakthrough to actually make me think that America wasn't completely barbaric and uncivilized for having put so many thousands of people in jail for possession of marijuana. And it was usually poor people or immigrants or African Americans, but it, it has been something I think that was, was made this country barbaric for literally locking people up in prisons for possession of, of marijuana. Just incredible. And, and to see, you know, it's almost like when homosexuality was illegal. You know, it's the equivalent, it's, it's, it's the moral equivalent of that. Uh, so I, I'm very happy that at least in California, New York, and a number of other states, but there are still states where there, it is not legal and you can still be arrested for it. And if that's not the most uh, unjust system of, of, of rule, I don't know what is. But I guess there's some states where you can't get an abortion after six or 12 weeks either. So it's, it's a crazy state of affairs, I do believe. So, so, what, um, so what about it makes it barbaric? You, I mean, no, the, putting people in jail for possession oh, of marijuana part, right, is, right. Is, 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 is barbaric, yes. So, um, but as a former addict, does it concern you that it has become legal? No, no, I'm thrilled. It's the, when I got out of rehab 27 years ago, the first thing I did was look for petitions to sign to legalize it. At that time, they were only standing outside Whole Foods. And it's, it's 27 years ago. And, you know, up until then, I was afraid to sign the legalize it uh, petitions that were going around. Uh, but once I quit, I was I thought I got to get my name on there. No, it, it's it's like I said, it's one of the great improvements in American society in many years that marijuana is legal. And it so, can also, so and back it, to your story about uh, uh, <laughs> Like traveling across the across the world to go get some. <laughs> yeah, I, I did it. I actually did it twice. It's all in the book. It was it was very exciting at the time. It was insane. It was insane, but it was exciting. And I didn't know any better. I didn't. Uh, you know, part of the book is about me losing my father when I was three weeks old, and what effect that might have had on the trajectory of, of my life. Um, I, I, I remember when I got back the first time from smuggling the hashish from Israel, I was still living at home with my mother. And, I, and she knew why I was going. She knew. She knew I was going. That uh, didn't stop me. And when I got back, I took my clothes off where the hash was hidden and I put it on the table and she said something at that moment that I'll never forget and I only think a Jewish mother would say that when her son dumps out all these drugs on the table. She said, are you hungry? That was her loving response and, and, and I, I was hungry and we sat down and ate and I never looked back as far as a career in the drug trade, acquisitions and distribution. Yeah, so you were an, oh, an entrepreneur early on. And now there's a shop almost on every block, every commercial block in Los Angeles, there are marijuana stores. We go in and they have bud tenders instead of bartenders. And I only went in once and it was a little disturbing to me as an ex-marijuana addict, but it was gorgeous. And I thought, thank God, you know, that this is happening because I could have gone to jail 
for many, many years just for having 300 pounds of pot in the trunk of my 300 car. 300 pounds, that sounds like a lot, bro. Well, it, wasn't just, <laughs> it wasn't just for me, okay? It wasn't, and that's all you can get in the trunk of a Volvo. Right, you know. been, more, but. So, I mean, so, so I do believe that there's, you know, there's a lot of medical benefits. Um, and, and in fact, what's popping is actually saying, um, you know, isn't it scary when people can't get it if they need it? Um, so I, I don't know if you can speak to that again, as an ex addict, you know, I guess on the flip side of that is, okay, but what if people are getting too much access? I mean, it's the same thing with alcohol, right? There's alcoholics everywhere too, so. Mm -hmm. Right, so what are you trying to say? Well, um, I just, I was actually asking you your thoughts on that. On, on, what, on what specifically? Like, well, the concerns of being able to, having free access to it, do you have any concerns about that? And the, maybe the already, advantages. You answered yeah. my question. You compared it to alcohol. Okay. Are people out there drinking more because you can get it on any street corner? Well, I don't know. I wasn't around during Prohibition, so, <laughs> so I don't okay. know. They were, throwing, they were throwing people in jail then, too. Yes. For distributing for sure. uh, yeah. alcohol. So yeah. I don't think, in fact, I've actually read that in the use of teenagers with marijuana actually went down a little. Yeah. Because it's no longer interesting or hip. It's like what your parents do. Nobody wants to do what their parents did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, but it is, and their parents are still smoking because they don't know they can stop. They think they're doing it to get high, but they're really just doing it because they're dependent on it. You know, I, I won't use the word addicted, but trust me, if you've ever tried to stop smoking pot, have you ever tried to stop drinking coffee? Uh, yeah, I, I actually like tea, so... Um, yeah, no, I had a, I had a diet Coke addiction many years ago. Oh, and so, yeah, so I never, never, never could kick it. And, um, one day I had a spiritual Kundalini rising and I literally woke up the next morning and I could only drink water. It disgusted me to even look at a can of diet Coke. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like drinking metal. It had a very metallic taste to it. And, yeah. I, and I see semi-intelligent people in restaurants and people I know ordering a Diet Coke. And I'm thinking, why are they pouring this chemical in their body? You know, yeah. would they pour it into their 10-year-old stomach directly without the alleged thrill of tasting it? You know, would you put soda in your body as if your body is not a freaking holy temple that should only be fed good, you know, pure food and pure drinks and and people are killing themselves. I was thinking about obesity yesterday. They should make food illegal. You know, people are killing themselves. I don't know what the statistics are. I was going to try and look it up. How many people die of obesity related illnesses? Yeah. No one's arresting them. And maybe people are pointing fingers. No, in fact, I think they're encouraging people to eat junk, but that's. <laughs> oh, this is, yes. You mean. Yeah. But let me reel this back into Please. like this. And I, wanted, I do want to read something out of here. I spent 10 yeah. years writing it. Yes, so. please. Finish okay. the story, and then I do want to talk about what your awakening was like and how you had the shift. So. Had the what? had your shift or your change or it was profound it was yeah it was extremely it was one of the most important experiences i've ever had uh anyway so um can i read the opening montage yes please go for it okay it's only two two minutes and 15 seconds opening montage a uh, camera descends through the delicious mists, mists above a pot of shimmering chicken soup 
at 4639 North 10th Street, the house where I grew up. There I am, having just been born into an idyllic Jewish family unit smack dab in the middle of the 20th century, with a working father, a beautiful housewifey mother, and a strong, handsome three-year-old three-year-old brother. I started life in North Philadelphia neighborhood called Logan, in a row house with mortgage payments my parents considered affordable. When mom and dad brought home their bouncing baby boy from St. Joseph's Hospital, my mother pressed her tender ear to my tiny chest and heard a heartbeat that was anything but regular. The next day, my mom called the delivery doctor and told her she heard something strange when she put her ear to my chest. The doctor already had detected a loud murmur associated with a bicuspic aorta valve disorder. The doctor didn't want to tell my parents right away that my defective heart about my defective heart and ruin the family's first night home with their beautiful new baby boy. There was an operation available to repair said defect, but in the 1950s, one out of 10 kids who went under the knife to repair the urn valve never made it back home to watch Howdy Doody. In those days, there was no heart-lung machine. The surgeon would have only three and a half minutes to, re to replace the little piece of shit valve. Mom was not about to play beat the clock with the life-threatening experimental surgery, but she was willing to bet that the operating room technologies would advance faster than my valve's heart health would retreat. My mom was certainly right on that respect. Three weeks after I took center stage, my, my daddy dropped dead of a heart attack on his way home from working the night shift at the post office. He was 34 years old. Suddenly there was a gaping hole in our lives. No father, no husband, no breadwinner. So that's just a little taste of the very, of the opening. Uh, and what more can I say? Uh, so that's why I was saying before, I think if I had had a father, he might have said, you can't go to Israel and smuggle back hashish. So you're kidding, you could go to jail for 25 years. But no one said that to me. And where I grew up, people were encouraging everyone to be very self-expressive, either uh, and I was a compulsive gambler at a very young age. And I think I was addicted to adrenaline. Maybe I was a hedonist. Maybe I was a little amateur Jewish hedonist and, and loved getting high. I didn't know it was self-medicating at the time. I thought it was getting high. And, and, I, and why do you want to get high? Because you're feeling low. You might think you're, you, what you do is so important and so essential because I think the whole opiate overdose epidemic of 100,000 deaths last year, 90,000 deaths the year mm -hmm. before, and this year will probably be more, is because there's a shortage of joy in America. There's a shortage of natural euphoria. I don't know why we could talk about why for a long time, uh, but there's a shortage of joy in this country even before the pandemic. Now it's 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 like living. Uh, well, but like, you nailed it. You nailed the why. You know the big the biggest part of the why is there are so many things. Whether it's it's uh, legalized marijuana or but, it's but wait, wait, the lack of well, wait. You're talking about why there's a lack of joy. Yeah, because you know part this is one of the answers to that is that people are that there are a lot of people that are self-medicating, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty But why common. are they self-medicating? Why aren't they happy without it? That's just it, is they maybe don't have the tools to heal those childhood traumas like what you're talking about. Right. And, and so, you know, for you, what was the, what was the, the, the changing moment and how did you get to those core issues that helped you to to not have to self-medicate. What was it for you that? Well, I thought I was having a nervous breakdown because I stood and couldn't stop shaking. I just went through a really bad breakup with the love of my life du jour. And I thought I was gonna get arrested by the police because someone I was very close to had just been arrested and I thought for sure they were gonna turn on me. So I decided to go check into a rehab. 
uh, A, I couldn't stop shaking. I had become dependent on the drug ecstasy, otherwise known as Molly, MDMA, uh, fabulous therapy drug, but I didn't really need therapy every night. But every time uh, my, my loved one and I got into an argument, the easiest way to make up was to do ecstasy. And it is a good drug for couples therapy, but we needed therapy every night, okay. probably from drinking too much. So you add ecstasy to excessive amounts of vodka and tequila, and you're going to have some. You're going to decompensate as a as an as a individual as a person. And I thought I was going to be arrested. One miracle led to the next. I won't go through the whole story, but it's it's in the book. It's called High. It's on Amazon, and you can order it from Barnes and Noble. Uh, I drove to a rehab, and when I got there, I, I they knew I was coming, and I said, is this where I check in? And the woman said, it's not a hotel. We don't check in here. You, you'll, you, you'll be admitted. We're, we'll, we will admit you. It's a hospital. I said, okay, it's great. Uh, and I, and I, I took my own car. I parked. I kept a separate set of keys in my sock that they did not find so I knew I could leave whenever I wanted because I had to surrender the keys to the car and two days after being there I'd already called my brother they gave me one phone call when I when I checked in called my brother in New York and said I can't stay here there's God all over the walls because they literally had the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous engraved into the you know, six steps here. Say, God, this, God, that. I thought this is not for me. And he said, Yeah, but you know, you studied with Ram Das. You went to Kyoto and, and went to the temples. And, and he says, You know, give it a couple more days. I said, Okay. So the second day I'm there, maybe third day, um, I wanted to leave. They give you this book called the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous which when they handed it to me felt like a copy of Mein Kampf it was, it was like what is it but at the back of the book there are stories that you know success stories they all end the same everybody lives uh, happily and I would read those stories to get to sleep and then I thought I'm leaving and then I for some reason opened up the front of the book where it starts talking about Carl Jung the Carl Jung is a, is 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 a, is is, is uh, acknowledged as one of the fathers of Alcoholics Anonymous because he was the one who told Bill W, yes, it's possible, it's possible to be a complete alcoholic and stop on a dime through something he called uh, something. What did he call it? replacement? Spiritus con spirit. People drink spirits to have a spiritual experience. He said, you don't really actually need the material uh, object. And people have had, it's what they call struck sober. But the point is, I thought, well, if they're talking about Carl Jung, who I adore, I'm gonna stay a little longer. The next day I walked outside. It was August, it was very hot, very hot. I walked outside and I felt something, something, literally something, reach down into my body, down to my toes, and extract all desire for drugs in, a, in about two seconds. It was like having a tooth pulled by a very, you know, by, by a really, I'm having a tooth pulled next week, I don't, I shouldn't be thinking about this, by a very malevolent, by a, by a beautiful, anyway, all desire for drugs left me. And I was the kind of person who thought, when I'm 80, I will be on a rocking chair on a porch smoking a joint. That, that's how my whole life was up until I was 44 years old. And here I thought, oh my God, I never have to smoke a joint again. And I didn't even tell them when I was admitted that I never smoked marijuana because I thought, I'm not going to mention it. They're not going to mention it. It's not why I'm here. I'm here to just stop shaking and not get arrested and quit doing ecstasy every day because my body was killing me. 
But now I'm just standing there thinking, I am free. I have been freed from the shackles of drug addiction. And it wasn't just marijuana. I couldn't leave the house without Percodan and Valium. I didn't always do them. Always had to have a couple mushrooms with me in case I ran into a, a hippie. And of course, uh, I'd done cocaine every single day of my life for 13 years. For 13 years, I did cocaine every day. But it was only in the 13th year that I thought I was addicted. Because the first 12 years, every time I did a line or a, a spoon, I did it because I wanted to. But it was in that 13th year that I told myself in the morning, I'm not going to get high until after dinner. But then after lunch, I'd end up doing some. And then I felt like, oh my God, I am trapped. I am like, I'm in, I'm up, you know, what's crap's sheep, 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 creek. It's creek. Uh, I didn't want to say shit creek because then I'm going to start talking about the TV show. Shit's I don't know that show, but okay. Oh my God. It's habit forming. It's the funniest show. One of the funniest shows ever. Okay. Really brilliant. Really brilliant. It really helped me. I but, watched but, them all at the beginning of the pandemic. But let's get back. So yeah, I can I back up though? So you had this experience yes, where you were cleared out. So this is almost like a Kundalini rising, like what I was talking about with my Diet Coke. Yes, ex um, exactly. Exactly. But was there, so being in that environment, is that what you think like triggered it to happen? Or do you think you were asking, you know, what, what do you think triggered or created that? I don't know. The... I, I did show the intent. I did, I did go. You know, I hadn't done any of the steps that AA suggests. Yeah. I hadn't done any of the writing yet. Yeah. I wasn't praying for my obsession to be removed. But I did drive there. You know, I did go. I did drive there myself. I was willing to, ultimately, I was willing to stay for a month. Uh, I was raising my son at the time, but he was away for the summer with his mother. So I had no excuse not to go. And uh, maybe it's the energy. That's why yeah. I recommend that if someone's having a problem with substance of any kind, take a month off. Go somewhere. Go somewhere good. Don't go somewhere that doesn't have a perfect reputation. I mean a perfect reputation. Go somewhere and see how you feel. See how you feel after a month of not drinking or not using. And if you like it, you know, keep going. The ironic thing was that the my 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 desire for alcohol didn't leave me, but I wasn't a classic alcoholic. I could go to a bar and have three beers, and quit and go home. Uh, I could have two shots of vodka and not keep drinking. But I love the idea of drinking. I love everything that drinking did. I was addicted to blackouts. I would have a blackout about once once a month because uh, I just loved being high with somebody and being intoxicated with someone. I loved white powders. After I quit cocaine, which was a miracle on its own, I ended up snorting ecstasy, which is really interesting flavor. Uh, don't try it if you haven't, trust me. Uh, it's not worth it. But, um, so, so, would you... so the point is that yeah. when I when I got back to Marin County, uh, the rehab says we we ask you to promise to go to some meetings, and I went to a meeting. Uh, almost on my way to a to a friend's wine tasting, like the night before, I was going to a wine tasting in Sonoma County. I went to a meeting, and someone shared their story, and at that moment, I decided to not drink for a year. I thought, okay, I haven't drank for a month, so it'll make it easier. And I took a vow eventually, you know, I took a vow to God that I wasn't gonna drink alcohol anymore. You know, after the first year, I thought I did it. It wasn't just the fad, because sometimes I think when, when, when you quit for a year, you've proved to everybody in your life that you're not a drug addict or an alcoholic, 
so you think it's time to start again. Luckily, that didn't happen to me, so it's been 27 uninterrupted years of not having a drink or, or any drugs unless I'm going through heart surgery or brain surgery, which I've done, and here I am, uh, the heart beating and the brain still working, but not obsessing on getting high. I couldn't drive. You're in Las Vegas. I'm in L.A. If I had to drive to Las Vegas, I would need at least four joints to get there. I mean, literally couldn't, I wouldn't go if I didn't have them, but I always had them. It's one of the benefits of being a drug dealer. You never run out. You never run out. So, uh, I don't know. There's no point to this other than if somebody doesn't want to, if someone can't stop using drugs and they want to, go get some help. You know, get some help. It's not hard to quit. It's, you just have to want to and get lucky and be blessed and, and allow grace into your life. Even, like I said, I, got, I backed into sobriety. I literally backed in. And when I parked, I backed in and I said, here I am. And uh, 28 days later, I realized I hadn't used drugs or drank. And that was miraculous. I didn't know if that was scientifically on the quantum yeah. level possible to not get high. So what would you say to somebody that um, that is at that point? Because I mean, there's some people that that are and they don't they don't want to quit. And that's fine. You know, that's good right. for them. That's but, their prerogative. But somebody, yeah. But if somebody does, how could they also back into it? <laughs> I mean, it's, it was a happy accident, right? How? <laughs> well, hopefully they can call their therapist and get a referral. Hopefully they can uh, ask everyone they know if they know of any good rehabs. Find someone in your life who's maybe been through it and ask them if they can recommend where they went. Yeah. I wouldn't say just go anywhere. So, uh, so what do you think? That's good. A, I'm sorry. You said it was, sorry. Uh, you said it was miraculous. So what would you say now, looking back, are the benefits of no longer having that desire? Still alive. Still alive is a biggie. Not in jail, another biggie. The fact that my son, when he was 20 years old, came to me one day and said, Dad, I think I need to go into treatment. And he did. Uh, he went to Betty Ford, where I had gone. He went for a month. That was 20 years ago. He hasn't drank or used a drug ever since. To think that every New Year's Eve, every Halloween, I don't have to worry about him drinking and driving or taking a pill in a disco, not knowing what it was. I did not give my mother that gift. So that that's that's one of the greatest things that my son followed my path. You know, originally he'd wanted to be a drug dealer. I said, you suck at math. You couldn't do this for a living. You better find something else you're good at. Yeah. But having gotten clean and sober, he saw people in my life, new people who were exciting and, and, and alive and vital. The other advantage is, I don't ever have to worry about walking through an airport again with joints or, or drugs in, in my underwear. I don't ever have to worry about... Are you, I, I was going to say, I, don't, I still don't think you can travel with it, right? Because different states have different um, legal yes. processes. And luckily, so. I wouldn't know. You know <laughs> not, that's not in my, in my purview or concern. Uh, so it sounds knowing, like somewhere knowing, along the knowing, you know what the greatest thing is? The clarity between me and the monitor and your smile, between me, the birds and the trees out there, the one or two that are singing, I hear it without anything. There's no gauze. You know, I did wear rose-colored sunglasses for 30 years. 
I don't ever wear sunglasses anymore, unless I'm dri literally driving into the sunset. There's nothing between me and reality. There's nothing between me and, and this. Um, there's nothing between me and the clouds. There's nothing between, what's to say, between me and death. Um, it's, it's, it's like being free. It's not being addicted, attached, imprisoned by any particular habit or substance. Yeah. And that's very freeing. I don't know. I hope everybody has already read. I mean, if they're coming to you every week or every day or every night, hopefully they've already read The, the Hero's Journey by, by Joseph Campbell. And they understand that if I, I got stuck in the world of marijuana addiction, stuck as a human being, and, and, and luckily I kept going and I'm not stuck anymore. And I accepted that I would be stuck in the marijuana, the fields of the marijuana plants forever because I liked it. And I didn't know there was another way. Uh, I remember like when I got out of the rehab and I got a schedule for AA meetings, I wanted to take them into my local roadhouse and show it to people, you know, sitting on the bench, on the, on the stools, drinking. I said, look, there's another way. There's, an, there's another way to live that you don't, you're not even aware of. And ultimately, everybody in the bar you end up seeing in AA if, if they're in the bar every night. Uh, so it's like I did want to go to the rooftops and shout out, there is another way. There is a yeah. better mousetrap. There yeah. is something that makes you will feel, you will never feel like a spiritual hypocrite. If you say anything remotely, like, oh, I listen to Alan Watts all the time, or yes, I read, you know, I went and saw Ram Dass a few times, but you're smoking pot every day, and then you're not? You can never peg yourself as a hypocrite, which I was, and now I'm not. I'm not, I'm not anything other than not a hypocrite. Yeah, that's interesting. And now I'm an author of, a, of an amazing book. There are Hi. lots of photographs, lots of sex, obviously drugs, a little rock and roll, a lot of jazz, a lot of uh, very dramatic stories, I'm told. People say it's a page turner. Because you can't believe the guy in the book lives, but I did. So I'm very grateful. So this where is, is the best place today. for them to get that? On Amazon? Or? Amazon. You can order yeah. it from Barnes and Nobles. You can even ask your library to order it if you don't want. Yeah. The download is 420 on Amazon. You can get a copy for $4.20. Uh, hopefully next month on April 20th. There'll be a big celebration for the book uh, because it's, it's, it's my relationship with marijuana. It took me five or six years of being clean and sober to actually be able to say, shit, I made a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't have gotten high every day for all those years. You know, because when you're in it and you're doing it and I, and I owned it, you know, I owned it, but it took a while for the grief to set in, for the grief of having thought, it means it's ironic and it's also contradictory. You know, what would I, my life have been, who would I have been if I didn't smoke pot every day? I wouldn't be here if I hadn't smoked pot every day. So that's the irony and that's the... The, uh, right, that's part of the life's journey, right? Is here I am still alive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it that's the uh, part of the ride. So <laughs> part of the ride. You can't second guess the past. Yeah, right. I don't think. I don't know. It's funny. So anybody who's out there who's still alive, who doesn't want to do drugs or drink anymore, it's you can do that. It's not a big deal. You know, it's like it's not. Yeah. This is a big deal. It's like they say, when you get clean and sober, you know what has to change? Everything. Everything has to change. Yeah. You but know who I'm thinking of. Good change. What's that? 
Say that? Well, I was I, I I was just thinking of Mike Lindell because you know he's been the out pillow the, guy? the pillow guy, the pillow guy, guy. <laughs> but so he was a life, crack right? addict. You know, he was a crack addict. And um, the lawyer just gave every crack addict a really bad reputation. Well, by um, comparing I, crack addicts to that guy, uh, that's that's a sin. That's a well, sin. The, Any the, crack that, addict living in America today has a higher consciousness than that. Well, I think that's a matter of opinion. It'll be interesting to My see opinion. what comes yes. out here I'm in the say. next. Uh, let me, let me just repeat that because it sounds so. good. It might actually be like what they what they call. Uh, you know, any every crack addict in America has a higher higher morals than Mike Lindell, that scumbag. Wow. So you've spoken definitely. Uh, again, I think that's a matter of opinion. And my um, opi my opinion. Yes. As a twenty seven years clean and sober person. I I was focusing on the fact that here's a guy that, regardless of your opinion of him, um, he built a a multi million dollar co company after also getting over his addictions. So yes, and President Putin just invaded. The, the Ukraine. Oh boy, so, yeah. Well, and and you like know they have talked about the country. bio labs where they're starting to come out with um, the whole reason why he's actually there. So you got to be careful about watching mainstream media. Um, yeah, it, it's like, important. You mean that, like MSNBC or Democracy Now? Absolutely, or any but, of those. So what about the bio Even lab? Fox News. What about the bio they're all lab? part of the same con what about conglomeration. The bio labs? So so. There's information now that, in fact, this was on the uh, co on the congressional floor. Um, I don't re I'd ha I don't remember the lady's name, but she's actually involved in this and admitted that they've been doing more research on you know the big. We're not even allowed to say this on YouTube, so that should tell you something. Um, but uh, the big, you know, pandemic that we've had uh, that they're actually pl they were planning another one. So. I haven't I haven't passed any judgment yet because that's uh, in fact they've already they've already found crisis actors. There's a lawsuit going on right now because of the bombing that they were that they were showing on the media. Turns out it was a video game. So something to look into that video game. That company is actually suing the Ukrainian government right now. So. Some bizarre stuff's going on in our world, and uh, yeah, I don't think you want to get into a political conversation with me because I'm more about the truth, <clears throat> not about like it, and your, your opinion you know, of the truth. Well, it's not my opinion. I'm saying I want to find out the truth, and so I don't just blindly follow what MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, all of them are all owned by the same people. So by assuming that that they're telling you correct information um I, I, and part of what i think that my channel is about is getting to the truth of and letting people decide for themselves rather than giving this is my opinion so and i i invite you and, as well as all of our viewers to go investigate that go take a look at i mean there's documentation there's video coverage of the congressional okay so what, saying saying the, so what you're saying is so what you're saying is that putin what did, what isn't doing about I'm it. saying I haven't passed judgment either way because I don't think that we've been given all of the information. So he and was so justified before, in attacking a country and killing people. I'm so not absolutely just, haven't said that. The question is, is, a good is, thing? is what's being that's a that's quite a leap of uh, assumption there, Leonard. <laughs> Just, so uh, <laughs> absolutely not. I'm saying, you're saying than, don't be, don't believe that Putin invaded Czech, uh, the Ukraine. No, I suggest that you actually do some research. Maybe look up the well, maybe didn't report and it. then go find find the documentation. Epic Times they source the information. And, so and I would recommend and, that people and, actually just go to try to to find the truth rather than making fun. assumptions and. Yes. I mean, the fact that there's so much censorship, I mean, my channel almost got shut down <clears throat> because of just having open conversations. So it's important that we have the freedom. And that's what you've been talking about is, look, look I don't judge anybody, whether they smoke pot, they drink alcohol, whatever. Um, 
but if you choose to be free, then let's stand for freedom. And that's what I stand for. I don't stand for wars. I don't stand for harming other people. I'm a very spiritual human being. That's what this is about. So, um, but the fact that we're being silenced and channels wait, are being wait, wait, shut down. Right what are, do you mean, wait, wait, how are we being silenced? What are you talking about? I got, I, I had two strikes on my channel and I'm, I, I talk about spiritual topics right? and my channel. So my channel almost got wiped out. There's, there's hundreds of thousands of people that their channels have been wiped out because they take a certain political position. So I think that that's a, a travesty that that sort of thing's happening in America and across the world. And so the ruling class is in charge of every aspect of our lives. So you're saying that you're okay with, with us being silenced. You're okay with, uh, shutting people down for having opinions yes that, yes you want to know why because i accept reality the way it is and that's what the ruling class does that's what the kings and the queens do we are serfs we are here to serve <laughs> the royals and the leaders and the people with the most weapons the people with the weapons tell us how to live so that they can make money with our taxes to buy more yeah. weapons. So from are you the, saying that you're good with friend. that? Are you okay with that? Or are you just saying that that's how it is? <laughs> I can't argue with reality. Reality wins every time. That's well, the way Well, reality it is. is we have a constitution in America and the number one, okay. and, and, and the first the first statement on there is freedom of speech. I, I, I mean, at okay. least that's what I thought. Remember what the lawyer tells so, you? A contract is only as powerful as <laughs> is only as powerful as the writ paper it's written on. Let me ask you this, and, and I, this might be a shocking no, question. Yes, so if somebody I'm says, right. "Hey, listen, can can I finish what I was gonna say?" Yes, sir. So somebody, and I appreciate this. I hope that you're, you know, I'm getting off on this. I gotta me. tell you the truth. So, so if somebody says, "Hey, look, bend over. We're gonna, you know." I, I'm going to be a little, like, try not to be too graphic, but bend over yeah. and take it in the, you know, what are you going to say? Well, this is just reality. And this is what I'm going to go with. Or are you going to say, hell no, like, I don't want to, I don't choose to be violated. I'm going to say, well, not without the KY. <laughs> You're going to say, wait, why not without the KY? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll go ahead. <laughs> because. <laughs> Let's put it this way. These people value life itself, not one twit. What? You know, they don't care about life. There's a great scene in the well, movie. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the New World Order. They want to bring us down to 500 uh, million population. Well, maybe that's why COVID was introduced into the world. Well, by the way, you're not allowed to say that on here. My channel could get a strike for using that word. <laughs> you know, no, no, one can, no one can prove that the government wasn't in on it to help population control. Right. Okay. And the same thing with the opiate overdoses. Seems oh, like well that, I mean, nobody that's important is trying to stop right? that. What's that? Doctors, I, that's actually documented that doctors were told they, um, not only were they paid to get people to take them, right? Yeah. Um, I actually saw a documentary about it where um, they were rated based on their, their you know, the, yes. The the, amount and so of they were getting smiley faces for basically the more they were giving people that happy drug. And so now you've got, I don't know how many, how many millions or hundreds of millions of people that are probably addicted at this point. I don't even know. I haven't followed that, but. Well, maybe follow the money. Follow yeah. the money. There and, you go. And, okay. So we can agree on that one. <laughs> You know, there's yeah. a great scene. Let me just close. I run a film festival, the Real Recovery Film Festival. Yeah. For the last uh, 13 years. Uh, but one of my favorite movies is called The Third Man, starring Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. It was written by, I just spaced out on his name. It takes place after the war. And, and uh, Orson Welles is in a Ferris wheel with Joseph Cotton. And, 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 H.G. Wells has been selling bad, uh, some bad drug on the black market that was meant to help people, but it was really killing them. Not intentionally, yeah. it just, it was a bad batch 
of an air of something. Uh -huh. And and Joseph Cotton says, how can you do that? And and they're at the top of the Ferris wheel. Uh, and, 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 and Orson Bean, I mean, Orson Welles looks down and he says, do you see all those people down there? See, they look like ants, don't they? You know, all of those people, they're, they're like little ants. And if there was one less, would that matter? If there were two less, would that matter? I'm making money. If there were three less, would that matter? That's the whole, that, that's the Constitution of the United States. Okay. Life you doesn't mean that matter. unwritten Constitution. Life itself does not matter yeah. to people in power. Period. And you can live with that. You can fight against it. You can't enjoy it. You can't really enjoy it. Um, you know, I run. I, I publish a newsletter. So at the end of the day, either smoke pot, smoke your brains out, and have the best time you can ever have, or be clean and have the best time you can ever have. Because at the that, end of the day, that we can right, agree on. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. There's things, regardless of government or whatever it is, there's things that what's that saying uh have peace with what the things you can control and and i think it's if you can't be with the one you love love the one you're with well that's <laughs> is that what you're thinking of <laughs> okay that wasn't the one i was talking about but yeah that too <laughs> and drink as much as you want just don't get into a car and drive and run over a family yeah okay. don't drink and drive okay and one more thing i publish a newsletter called the Addiction Recovery E-Bulletin. It's very non-political, addictionrecoveryebulletin.org. And next week, there's the article that just came out about the 14-year-old who shot and killed a four-month-old. And guns are, how many people do you think get shot in England or Japan a year? Oh, so part of the article says, Every single day in America, the country you love and I live in, uh, 22 children are shot. Five end up dying. Five a day children end up dying from gunshots every yeah. single day. The country was founded on killing Indians. So you wonder why people are violent? That's how we got here. Okay? Um... So I'm happy to be here because I go to the movies, I go listen to music, I hang out with friends. Uh, currently I'm single, but I'm looking, I'm open. So if anybody... Uh... <laughs> it's on Amazon, Make don't forget Make that. a comment, it's yeah. It's called High. Maybe it should be called Still High. Hey, I... Uh, you get me I, so excited, I can't even stand it. I, I have to wrap up here, are there any uh, were those your parting words, or do you have a, a couple more to wrap it up? When you get the message, hang up the phone. Uh, or I can no, just <laughs> get good. my book. It's a lot of fun. It, it really came right. out better than I would have ever expected. And there's poems, and there's photographs, and there's sex, and uh, fun stories. Okay. I guarantee you will enjoy it. If not, Thank you for I'm on, I'm on Facebook, today. Facebook, Leonard Bouchel, Facebook. If oh, you buy this book and you don't like it, I will absolutely send you back 1995. Okay. Seriously. I'm, I'm serious. If you get, if you get it and you don't like it, it's a, it's pretty easy name to hi. So I think they right. got it. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you today. Thank um, you. A pleasure, Dr. Joy. Mm-hmm. <laughs>